So let's just start with a prayer. Lord God, our Heavenly Father, we come to you this Monday morning and we ask, Father, for you to bless our time together, and that you will open our eyes to your word and that you will speak to us and that we might meet your son again for the first time, as it were, and that we might get in the spirit of the Apostle Paul, one of your greatest servants, and that we might also surrender our lives completely, our whole hearts, our whole soul, our strength, our mind, our heart to you. And to go the way of your son, as he did and as many others have done down through history. So please go with us, Father, and bless us and guide us and bring us all to the everlasting life of your kingdom, which your son died to make possible. For his sake. Amen. Amen. Right, so, after these things, Paul departed from Athens and went to Corinth. Now, when he was in Athens, he had been involved in all this sort of intellectual uh, discussion with all the philosophers on Mars Hill and all that, and yeah, he did make a few converts. And now he goes to Corinth, which was known as a total cesspit, full of whores and gamblers, full of, uh, you know, pagan stuff, idols, everything, every kind of perversion. So that if somebody was uh, like a real low life pervert or a real low life kind of person, they'd say, oh, he's a Corinthian, she's a Corinthian. Corinth was known as like the total moral cesspit of the whole planet. So he, or oh, Roman Empire, so he goes there with the gospel. Now when you when you read in the Bible, you've got to put it all together. And he writes two letters to the Corinthians. When you read those letters, you get some more information. He says to them, when he writes to the Corinthians, he says, when I first came and preached the gospel to you, he said, I was, I was shaking. I was trembling and I was in much fear. And he also says to them, he says, you remember when I came and preached the gospel to you, he said, I never asked for any money. I worked with my own hands to provide what was needed. And he was a tent maker. So that slightly um, changes the picture that you get here when you just read in Acts 18 that, oh yeah, Paul rocked up at Corinth, next town on the road. Well, he came there with fear and much trembling. I think something had happened in Athens that, that traumatized him. Probably had some sort of post-traumatic stress. Paul must have had PTSD. He must have had post-traumatic stress disorder. He must have had mental health issues. After all that he went through, <coughs> you know, being stoned to death, leaving him as dead, beaten, whipped, put in prison in Philippi, etc., tortured, I mean, his body must have been quite a mess, broken bones, probably been punched on the nose a few times, broken his nose. He would have had all sorts of uh, uh, scars on his back from where he'd been whipped. And those scars would, would have been permanent for life. And so, you know, it would have all built up. And he gets to Corinth and he's, um, he's shaky. He says, when I first came to preach the gospel to you, I, I was weak and I was trembling. But as he himself said, when I'm weak, then am I strong? And this is it, that you have to go through these experiences one way or another until you, uh, before you are ready for God. You, you won't be ready for him to use you unless you have got to that broken point, I'm afraid. You know, the, the, it's not the case that, you know, God's just there to give you an easy ticket through life. No, it, it, Jesus is for the broken it's as simple as that. So he gets to Corinth, and he finds another Jew there called Aquila, a man of Pontus, who'd lately come from Italy with his wife Priscilla because, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to depart from Rome, and he went to them. And because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and they worked together, for by trade they were tent makers. So you've got this little extra bit of info that the Emperor Claudius had told all the Jews to get out from Rome. And so they'd left. But in the book of Revelation, Rome is spoken of as Babylon, and the Lord Jesus says, come out from among them. Come out of Babylon. Get out of Babylon. So I think he's saying, separate from that Roman system. Uh, um, separate from that Roman system. <laughs> And so what had happened is that, yeah, okay, so we've got to leave Babylon. But what he does, what God does, is to confirm the minute. 
Claudius, the emperor, says, oh, Jews, I want all Jews out of Rome anyway. So if you want to be obedient, God will help you to be obedient. And that is what you've got here, that they were helped in their obedience. It's an upward spiral. If you want to be obedient, you want to be spiritual, God will help you in that. If you don't want to be, he'll even confirm you in the downward spiral. So they worked together because they were tent makers. So Paul had this, this uh, training as a tent maker that he used whenever he went to terms of Thessalonians as well. He said, you know, I, I, I never asked you for any money. I worked with my own hands. He tells the Corinthians the same. When I came to you, I wasn't asking for your cash. I was, um, I was just working as uh, a day and night, he says, I was working to support myself. So very far cry from mega wealthy pastors boasting that they have got gold toilet seats encrusted with diamonds because the Lord blessed them. I mean, rubbish. I was sitting there, as you might have just seen, with uh, Spiros, and uh, yeah, I got a beep beep on my phone. I look at it, and there's this woman who, she, take, she uh, messaged me this morning, uh, would you baptise me? I said, yes, I would. I don't know where she is. She's in the UK somewhere. And then she sent another text and said, um, yeah, but what's the financial catch? How much do you want for it? I said, well, nothing. I don't charge a baptised people. He goes, oh, really? And I've just shown the email to uh, Spyro, and uh, we were sitting there looking at my phone, that's what we are looking at. And she said, oh, we're in my church, they, um, they ask for 300 pounds for a consultancy session with the pastor. Get real, get real. And you know how all this goes on. And that's why so many people are against Jesus, unfortunately, because they look at his representatives, the church and say so, ah oh, but it's all it's all a ripoff it's all religion it's all churchianity yeah not wrong absolutely not wrong but that does not take away from the truth of jesus christ yeah, jesus is real he died for us he is now in heaven looking down at us guys here in croydon and he will come again no doubt and so as i say don't let all the sort of uh, showbiz that is in what is called Christianity put you off because it does put off a lot of people and I understand that but you can't judge God by his representatives so as I say you get back to original first century Christianity you've got one of the big the big lights of the church Paul is a tent maker Peter was a fisherman now tent makers apparently were despised that it was low income work Although you could pick it up and do it as you travelled around anywhere, it was apparently low income work. And the material that they used to make tents would have been animal skins. And a lot of those skins were from unclean animals. So I think this, this trade, as it were, made Paul ritually unclean under the law of Moses. So you see how God in the bigger picture gently, very gently, God is so gentle, he very gently, bit by bit, inch by inch, leads you to truth. He leads you to understand. Well, verse 4, Paul reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded Jews and Gentiles. I've talked about this before, that he was the apostle to the Gentiles, that is to the non-Jews, but he's got nothing short of an obsession with preaching to Jews. He, as soon as he goes to every town, he's like, oh, where's the Jews? Where's the synagogue? Oh, he goes there. And he was an ex-rabbi, right? And he starts arguing with them. And yes, he persuades some of them, but then they get cranky and start attacking him. Whereas Peter was the apostle to the Jews and Paul to the Gentiles. And if Paul had just accepted that, and said, yeah, okay, so my job is not to preach to the, to the Jews, that's Peter's job. I will go to the non-Jews, to the Gentiles. I think if he'd have done that, his life might have just gone a lot uh, smoother, a lot calmer. So, verse 5, but when Silas and Timothy came down from Macedonia, Paul was occupied with the word. Well, in the King James it says, 
Paul was pressed in the spirit when Silas and Timothy came. And he testified to the Jews that Jesus was the Christ, the Messiah. It's as if those two, Silas and Timothy, encouraged him. But there he was all on his own, pretty well, witnessing and preaching. As soon as he had two others with him, he did so even more enthusiastically. And so you see how it goes, that this is the purpose of Christian fellowship, to encourage each other. But Paul alone, yes, he was preaching. Oh, Silas and Timothy come. Ah, hey, yes, he's pressed in his spirit to testify more passionately. And this being pressed in the spirit, that when you see human need, and when you see that you can make that difference, that you have in your hands, if you like, eternal life, that I can give you, I can give her, I can give them. You are pressed in the spirit. And I said the other day that it's a bit like when you're, if you're on an aeroplane and you're coming down the land and you see all these little cars driving around the streets and everything looks so little and small. You think, oh, yeah, your heart bleeds for humanity in its lostness. You stand on the corner there on the main drag here in, in Croydon. It's people, heave, people are heaving past you, loads of people. But where are they going? To an eternal grave, to death. And yet we have in our hands the opportunity to give them eternity. So no wonder he is pressed in his spirit. He feels, I must do something, I must testify. Now all of us are shy. All of us are shy. And even if you're an extrovert, when it comes to preaching the gospel... Probably you are. We all are nervous to uh, get a word in for the Lord. You know, conversations go, and oh, oh, how can I swing that conversation round to the Lord? Even if you're an extrovert, there's some barrier and shyness in all of us. But when you see the, the need that there is in humanity, you see that you and me have got the opportunity to actually give somebody eternity. You know, that is honestly like you are... You're, you're standing there on the street corner with like literally millions of pounds in your hand. And you know that you've got another stash of like 100 million around the corner sitting in, in your friend's van. You know, and you're giving it out to people. You want to give it away. And, and it's even more so with the, the priceless message of eternity. You, we are pressed in the spirit that I want to give this away. Well, verse 6, they opposed themselves and blasphemed. When they did this, he shook his raiment and said to them, Your blood be upon your own heads, I am clean. From henceforth I will go to the Gentiles. Well, I have given up with you guys, you Jews, I am going to preach to the Gentiles. He says this so many times, and he gets cranky and ratty with the Jews. He goes, oh yeah, I am giving up with you guys, I am going to preach to the Gentiles. But he keeps on coming back to the Jews. The example here. So he, he says, right, uh, henceforth from now on, I'm going to the Gentiles. Verse 7, he departed thence, and what does he do? And he entered into a certain man's house called Justice, one that worshipped God, that is, he was a, a sort of a, a convert to Judaism, whose house joined hard to the synagogue. And Crispus, the chief ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his house, and many of the Corinthians hearing believed and were baptised. So he says, oh, I'm giving up with the Jews, I'm going to the Gentiles. What does he do? He goes and, and rents the house next door to the synagogue. <laughs> he can't leave him alone, can he? And he baptises Crispus, the chief ruler of the synagogue. Now, I've spoken about this before, and I'll say it again, that he, it's not that he sinned, but it's that he made life harder for himself than it needed to be. By continually provoking the Jews, especially him as an ex-rabbi, he was only making them get really worked up and narky and cranky with him. If he'd gone to the Gentiles, it wouldn't have been such a problem. And this eventually leads, to, I think, to his arrest, his death in Rome, etc., where maybe it needn't quite have happened in all the years he spent in prison, maybe. That was because the Jews had falsely accused him. And I said that when we're looking at Acts 16, that when he sails to preach to the Gentiles the first time, Luke's with him, and Luke says, we had a straight course to, uh, 
like going to Philippi, going to Greece, as we would call it. He said we had a straight course. And in those days, sailing ships, the wind was really as important which way the wind was blowing. If the wind was blowing against you, you have a very, you're not going to get there. Yeah, because you're trying to go against the wind. And if the wind is blowing that way to an angle, well, you're going to have to tack to try to keep on course. But when he went, the first time really to, to go out, out preach to the, the Gentiles and responded to, to the Macedonian call to take the gospel to us here in Europe, the wind was directly behind him, blowing him directly on the boat, directly to where he needed to go. And the wind is the spirit. In Hebrew and in Greek, it's the same word for wind as spirit, pneuma in the uh, in Greek and Ruach in, in Hebrew, it means both wind and spirit. And so they, the, the idea is that God's spirit was directly behind him. Uh, Corinne, do you want to go to KFC? Oh, oh, yeah. So God's spirit was directly behind him, blowing him directly on the course. But every time he tries to get caught up with arguing with the Jews, it gets problematic. So. Was he doing the wrong thing by preaching to the Jews? Well, no. But he's making life harder for himself. And as I say, there are things in life that we do that are sin. And a sin is a sin. But you can also not quite go the ideal way that God intends for you. And you don't have to make life harder for yourself than it needs to be. So, the great thing is to keep on saying to the Lord, what do you want from me? What is your hope for me? You know, Paul says... Ephesians, there were good works that were set up for us to do before the foundation of the world. We say to him, what, what do you want from me? What would you like me to do for you, Lord? And that man is never better than when he is doing God's work, going God's way, doing what God wants, and being empowered. So, he still, he can't leave the Jews alone. He goes back, rents the house, basically, next to the synagogue, part of the same building, it says it joined hard to the synagogue. He baptises a lot of people. It says, verse 8, many of the Corinthians hearing believed and were baptised. I think he had that in mind when he wrote to the, to the Romans, faith comes by hearing, or belief comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. So you don't just believe, just like that. Faith has got to have a basis, and that basis is in the Word of God. That's why I keep encouraging you to read the Bible for yourself. Because faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. So, these Corinthians heard the Word, they believed, and were baptised. It's a seamless process. Then spoke the Lord, that's the Lord Jesus, to Paul in the night by a vision. Be not afraid, but speak, and don't hold your peace. For I am with you, no man will sit on you to hurt you. For I have much people in this city. He continued there to you in six months, teaching the word of God among them. So Jesus has to appear to him in a night vision and say, Do not be afraid. Don't keep quiet. Preach. So this rather changes our view of Paul. That Paul is not sort of this fearless, macho, sort of bloke who just turns up and stares death down in the face. Are oh, you going to kill me? Yeah, I get it. No. That's how you can think of Paul. But I don't think that's right. You get the impression here of a man who's frightened. A man who's nervous. To whom Jesus has to appear and say, go on. Don't be quiet, Paul. Speak. I am with you. No one's going to hurt you. It is almost how you might talk to a child. I'm with you. No one is going to hurt you. And as I say, when he writes to the Corinthians, he says, you remember, because they were saying, oh, you're no good, Paul. We're going off with someone else now. And he says, look, don't be so tough on me. Don't you remember when I first came and preached the gospel to you? He said, I came to you shaking with fear. I was trembling. I was in much weakness. But... God's strength is made perfect in weakness. It was to the Corinthians that Paul wrote that. And so what he's saying is, is that, or what we get from this rather, is that Paul was very nervous and very weak. And yet that weak Paul was used by God. And so it is through weakness, 
It is through weakness that we will be used. That's why if you're proud and arrogant, you won't be. And as I say, when people get confused by churchianity and they see proud, arrogant pastors and priests and all the rest of them, with all this money and all this power, they're like, nah. Uh, some things, there's a big mismatch there. And don't forget, we're following a man, the Lord Jesus, who we're told had nowhere to lay his head. He was a carpenter, the son of a carpenter, as was thought. He was a manual worker who was not a wealthy guy at all. So, <clears throat> I am with you. It's a very simple statement from Jesus. I am with you. And that is actually uh, taken out of the Great Commission, where Jesus says, go and preach the gospel into all the world. I am with you to the end of the age. So it's as if, if you really want to commit yourself to sharing the gospel with people, you will have a very special presence of Jesus with you. And Jesus says, I have much people in this city, so therefore keep on. The implication is if you don't keep on, that's not going to happen. In other words, potentially there are people that the Lord Jesus can use and take for himself. But if we don't do our part, then they won't be saved. So that's a wonderful thing, that he's dealing with potentials, and yet we can let the baton drop. We can fail him. We don't want to do that. We don't want to fail him. We want to make it real, and to, to not betray his trust of us. It's like, you know, as Paul again says, we have been entrusted with the gospel. Now, God took a chance on us and said, look, I trust you to do the work. Now, I hope you're not going to mess up. I hope you're going to do it. And it's like in the parable of the, the pounds or the talents or whatever, that the master of the house is like the Lord Jesus, takes all his wealth and splits it up amongst his slaves and says, now you guys go and trade with this and do what you can. So like, oh well, I've got this great responsibility to, to, to use what he's given me to trade with it, to, to do his business. But you can mess it up, you can chuck it away, you can fail, you can be lazy, or whatever. So God has sort of taken a chance on us. And it's not that, oh well, if I, if I mess up, he'll find someone else. Not necessarily, that's not the, necessarily the idea. And so it was here, Paul is being told, if you don't do your part that you're called to at this moment, well, it's all going to spoil. It's rather like in another picture the Lord Jesus gives of the harvest. He says the harvest is, is there's loads of harvest out there, but the laborers are few. And if there aren't enough workers to gather in the, the, the ripe grapes, then the harvest is going to spoil. It's not going to work out. And it's a tragedy that a harvest of good grapes is going to spoil. But that's what's going to happen. Because there are not enough people to gather them in. Or those, again, in the Lord's parable, the work, workers in the, in the vineyard. Some of them are, are lazy, some of them work harder than others, or whatever. But the, the tragedy is that there are people who would come to Jesus, but we let, we let the, the, the baton drop. We don't do our part. And as so I Paul was... Uh, on the verge of being in that, in that position. I've got much people in this city, but unless you speak up and get over your fear and get over your hang-ups and get over your PTSD or whatever it is, then you know, they're not going to be one for me. Now, why does God work in that way? I can only say he does it because he wants to build relationship with us so that we see our importance, that I am significant. And you can never be more significant than when you are actually, as I say, bringing someone to Jesus so that they become his people. It doesn't matter whether you've made it or not made it materially in secular life. That is totally nothing to do with it whatsoever. The greatest thing you can do is God's work. And there is no unemployment, as it were, in his economy. We are all called, 
not simply to be saved, but to actually do something for him. We are all part of the body of Jesus. So we have all got that function, some function. And if you don't perceive what your function is, then ask him. If you've not been baptised into that body of Jesus, we'll get baptised. Spyro, myself, just talk to us or Colleen or uh, come back to our place in South Croydon, get baptised, talk to Dottie or anyone here. Come back, just get simply baptised into Jesus. As simple as that. Right, if you'd like to pass the um, bread and the uh, cup out, that bread represents the body of the Lord Jesus. And thank you, Ian, for the lovely wafers and for Ian for giving us the uh, non-alcoholic wine. And the, uh, the non-alcoholic uh, wine, the grape juice, represents the blood of Jesus.